Hey what's going on gamers, here goes another development vlog of my NES game Cold and Starving which you can download for free from the links in the description as usual. So I wanted to bring back destructible obstacles to my game that could be easily destroyed and better looking than what I had before. The first problem I ran into was that I had no more space for any new tiles because my tile set was mostly filled with tiles that were meant for the crashed plane. What am I supposed to do? I know. What if I could use the same technique that I used before to load the villager graphics? I could store the plane tiles as a separate binary blob and I would only load it when you enter the crash site location. After tweaking my routine that loads chunks of graphics data into cartridges CHR RAM, I was finally able to free up this large area for the new tiles. When I enter the crash site, the game fills this area with the playing tiles, but when I'm not there, this area could be used for something else. So the first thing I've added there was these tiles of a cracked stone. My initial goal was to add two stone blockades, one in front of the granite location, so you would not get to the granite that easily, and a second stone inside of the secret cave. As you see, those blockades are made of four tiles, so we have another problem. With my existing destructible tile system, you could only break one tile with a hammer at a time. But unfortunately, probably no one's gonna chop the obstacle tile by tile. Also, I did not want to waste the space in RAM with four destructible tile statuses for one obstacle, because surprise, surprise, I already almost filled the entire NES RAM full. I needed to come up with some solution. And I did. I created just a simple array. And thanks to it, now I can associate a state of one byte with multiple destructible tiles and destroy the stone when one hit. To guide the player and inform how to destroy the stone, I created a new letter item. It's the third one. I also had to tweak the item respawn system for it. So the items of this particular type, I call them documents, could not respawn after being picked up. Not sure if it's a good decision, but I don't want to have multiple instances of these items. After that, I had to tweak the villager quests a bit. Basically, Erica now should give you the super hammer so you could break that stone. It happens after the second quest, after you bring her the knife. Although I kinda feel it's a bit too early, so probably I will change that later. Last time I forgot to mention one thing, I've changed how the jam looks, now it's no longer a jar. Since the berries are basically an HP up, I thought perhaps the player might think that the jam that you can craft from Two piles of berries is also some kind of a healing potion, like the red HP potion in Diablo. So I decided to transform the jar into a bowl filled with some red goop. I think this would look more like a food item, which this item is supposed to be. Also I had to go through all the dialogue lines and change the ones that mentioned a jar. Another thing I made was the possibility to destroy the skeleton in the cave, because I've noticed that people try to poke it. So here you go, now you can destroy it. Of course the skeleton will respawn the next time you enter the cave. And it doesn't drop anything, at least yet. I continued working on the quests. There were these congratulatory lines where the villagers would try to tell you how to make certain things as a reward. My issue was that these lines were just text only. I wanted them to have sprite images like the quest lines. That way you could clearly see what items you need to combine. So I put some elbow grease to display sprites there as well. After these changes I decided to play my game and I was terribly disappointed. 
It appears that when you break the stone, go home, and then return back, the stone is still there. Huh? Previously I used the destructible tiles in relatively small locations, and they were constantly drawn to the particular addresses during every NMI. But this time the name table addresses did not match. Perhaps the name tables were flipped while scrolling, or maybe they were reset when I entered and exited the house. So that's why the empty tiles were not drawn on top of the stone. Oh boy, then I made a very dumb decision. I wrote a super complex routine that would inject modified tiles on top of the updated map column as you scroll. It created a new problem. Some map columns were not updated because the update routine became bloated and slow and did not prepare the data on time. My final solution was to make sure at all costs that the name table addresses remain the same for the places where there are some destroyed tiles. I also improved the destroyed tile drawing. Now they are controlled by the so-called dirty flag. After each map column update, I would tell to the game that the flag is dirty and the game has to update the destroyed tiles. There was another annoying issue. After moving to a different location, a bunch of weird looking sprites would appear on the screen and would stay there forever. My guess was that maybe the sprite update routine was interrupted by the NMI. I solved this by putting a maximum 8-bit number as the value of tainted sprites as you enter a different location. The game would hide the tainted sprites that are not used, so the weird sprites are gone now. I mentioned that I've almost run out of the NES RAM. Almost means that I filled mostly everything except first 256 bytes or the page 0. While trying to transfer some frequently used variables to this page, I've noticed another interesting thing. Apparently, you can shrink your code and save a lot of space in the ROM just by moving variables to that first page. Most of the assembly routines run faster if you use the variables from the page 0, because it's much easier for the CPU to calculate addresses for that page. Also because of that, the bytecode in the ROM is much smaller. Of course, I did not move all the frequently used uh, variables to the page 0 at once. But just look at how the free space changed by just moving a few. I don't remember why exactly, but I decided to create a new song for the nighttime in the game. I grabbed my yellowed MIDI keyboard that I bought for 5 euros and experimented a bit. The result is not the greatest, but it's my attempt at something that sounds kinda sinister. So this tune starts playing when the night comes, or when you enter the cave. Once the sun rises, the song should change to a previous one. I also wanted to play the song as the evil ending tune. But since the default title song that used to play during the ending cutscene is also kinda dark, I decided to create two new songs for the good and evil endings. And I did. As usual, nothing to write home about. The good ending song starts as if a Pokemon <laughs> is about to evolve. Most likely I will try to improve both melodies, or perhaps I will create entirely new ones. I still have a bit less than one kilobyte in the bank where the music is, so I think that's plenty enough for the song improvements. Lastly there was this big issue. Why the heck the game became so horribly slow? My first guess was maybe the collision detection code is crap because now it also had to check more destructible tiles. Without doing any testing, I created two separate collision detection routines. One is used 
only by the player character and it checks if the destructible tiles are gone and if it's possible to go through. The second routine is much more basic, it ignores the destructed tiles. So all the animals and projectiles now use it. So did it make a significant difference? Unfortunately not really, but now you can at least exploit it. You can kill enemies more easily by standing on a destructed tile. Then I turned on the Messens profiler. I don't really have a clue what exactly I need to track there. I assume that the routines that have the largest amount of calls and longest execution time cause the lag. So after a couple of minutes playing I've noticed that the routine which is responsible for checking if the player damages NPCs has a suspiciously high amount of calls. I don't remember if I mentioned before but I don't do my game logic in one go. So basically I assign a particular delay for each thing like I wait 100 of my game loop iterations until I try to check the input or I wait 133 iterations and only then I run the animal AI. While the time is ticking the game can do other stuff. The problem here is that my numbers are kinda random and I haven't checked how much time it takes for these particular tasks to be done. Plus the execution time is constantly changing when I add new features. So to solve my current slowdown I decided to increase the delay number for the player damage checks. To my surprise the game speed improved significantly and the animals now move a lot faster. Also while fixing all this I found a funny bug that happened when you got killed in the boss room. What is even going on there? And that's about it. As in my previous video, the shoutout goes to the awesome channel members, Retro Sorkas and Tim Beimer. If you want to also support me and appear on this wall of awesome, you can join the channel membership. So yeah, thanks for watching till the end, hit that like button, subscribe so you won't miss my new videos and I will see you in a next one. Bye bye.